Well, it is my privilege to be able to introduce you all to Ted and Becky Fletchall. And Ted and Becky were accepted as missionary appointees under Baptist Mid-Missions in 1981. And uh, they're sending church, Emmanuel Baptist Church in Des Moines, Iowa. And the Lord led them, I don't want to take too much thunder away from your presentation, but led them to uh, Austria first and then uh, for 15 years and then moved on to Germany uh, where they've been ministering since uh, 2003. Uh, now they're on this whirlwind tour, right, of all the supporting churches um, all over the United States and uh, from Colorado to New Jersey and we're so blessed and grateful that you're able to stop with us and, and share with us this morning. And we praise the Lord together for your uh, work, God's work through you over these 40 years or so, spreading the gospel message um, across the world. And uh, we will begin with a video presentation, but if we could, uh, just as a way of welcome, just welcome the Fletchalls. Greetings from the Fletchalls. My name is Ted, and this is my wife, Becky. We want to thank you for your faithful support as we have served the Lord in Austria and Germany the past 36 years. Shortly before we left for the field for the first time in 1985, we chose 1 Samuel 12:24 as our family verse. Only fear the Lord and serve Him in truth with all your heart, for consider how great things He hath done for you. God has been faithful to our family as we have represented your church in fulfilling the Great Commission. Now our children are all grown up and have families of their own. By God's grace, each of our four children know Christ as their personal Savior and have married Christian mates and are serving the Lord in their local churches. In 1985, we left for the field. After two years of language school in Munich, Germany, we began our church planting ministry in Austria. Having grown up as an MK in Munich, Becky was fluent in German and did not need to attend language school. We lived in the heart of the Austrian Alps in the town of Fultmas. Austria is known for its majestic mountains its beautiful valleys, and its colorful traditions. During our 15 years of ministry in Austria, the Lord used us in the lives of many people. People were saved and baptized, discipled, and a church was organized in the town of Fultmas. A highlight of our ministry in Austria was the summer camps that were held in conjunction with our Baptist and Missions missionaries in Germany. In 2003, the Lord led us to leave Austria and start a new work in Geisenheim, Germany. Looking to the cross, people turned to the Lord and followed the Lord in believers' baptism. We were blessed by the ministry of visiting speakers such as Dr. Manfred Kober and Baptist Mid-Missions President Vernon Rosenau, who is now with the Lord. In 2012, the church in Geisenheim merged with an independent Baptist church in Mainz, Germany. Becky's brother, Kevin Pals, and his wife, Marjean, made a special trip to Germany to help us renovate the church in Mainz by putting in a kitchen for the church. The Lord gave us much fruit for our labor during our time in the church in Mainz. Becky had the privilege of leading a university student named Julianne to Christ. Shortly after the two churches merged, the Lord provided a lovely place for us to live in the city of Ingelheim. I loved having a small flower garden, and it is so much a part of the German culture. Ingelheim is located on the Rhine River. There are many castles and fortresses along the banks of the Rhine River in our area. Some of them have been renovated and turned into modern hotels and youth hostels. Ingelheim is the home of an international pharmaceutical company named Böhringer. Böhringer employs over 47,000 people worldwide. The company's language is English. 
Whereas the majority of Austrians are Roman Catholic, Germany is more diverse. Approximately one-third of Germany is Roman Catholic, one-third is Lutheran, and one-third is mixed or no religion. The majority of this mixed group is no religion. The affluence of German society has caused most Germans to forget about God. Although Germany is the economic powerhouse that holds the European Union together, the vast majority of Germans are unsaved. Of the 82 million people in Germany today, only 1 to 2 percent are born-again Christians. Many no longer believe in the existence of God, making them practical atheists. Islam is the third largest religion in Germany, and it is growing rapidly. Crystal Beagle joined our team in 2013. Crystal was a big help with the children's ministry. While holding Bible studies in our home, our team decided to help renovate an English-speaking Baptist church in Wiesbaden. This was our third church renovation project during our 36 years of ministry in Austria and Germany. After helping the church in Mainz, the Lord led us to start a church in our hometown of Ingelheim. Ingelheim is located about 15 miles away from the city of Mainz. After much prayer and seeking the Lord, He led us to sign a rental contract in 2016 for a building in Ingelheim where we could hold services. This was our fourth renovation project in our 36 years of ministry in Austria and Germany. Again, we cleaned, painted, and arranged a place where we could publicly worship our wonderful Savior and win precious souls to Christ. This is fun. Yeah. This is what missionaries do for a living. Jakob Kostoff was a big help. He and his wife Lydia became charter members. Yvonne Smith joined our team in 2015, just in time to help us with the church renovation. She worked with college-aged young people until she returned to the States to care for her aged mother. In John 14, 6, Jesus said to Thomas, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. In Germany, it is legal to put literature in people's mailboxes. Our team has put over 10,000 gospel tracts and invitations in mailboxes in Ingelheim and the surrounding villages. We also set up a Bible and Christian book table at the local farmer's market once a month. We passed out balloons with the words, Jesus loves children, handwritten on them. They were a big hit and a conversation opener. Crystal collected over 100,000 Legos for our Lego City outreach in our church. One of the exciting opportunities for young people interested in missions is to participate in the Germany Trek program. The Germany Trek program is designed to give college-age students an opportunity to see what life and ministry are like in Germany. The students stay in the homes of missionaries and English-speaking nationals to get a taste of what it is like to live and serve the Lord in Germany. The Germany Trekkers help in practical areas such as painting church facilities, as well as giving their testimonies and singing. And last but not least, they get to experience adventures like the climbing park in Wiesbaden or learning new skills. If you or someone you know is interested in going on the Germany Trek program, please contact Baptist Admissions or pick up a brochure on our display table. One of the highlights of our time in Europe has been the ministry of Faith Baptist Bible College Chorale in Ankeny, Iowa. We were blessed by the ministry of the Faith Baptist Bible College Chorale in each of the churches where we have served. The Chorale enjoyed taking a romantic boat ride down the Rhine River. After the last concert, we gave homemade cupcakes with a gospel tract to the government and business people who helped with the concert. 
The crowning event of our 36-year ministry was the organization of the Freie Baptistengemeinde in Ingelheim, Germany. In his perfect timing, God sent Luke and Bethany Snell and their two boys, Judah and Isaiah, to join our team in January 2021. Luke is a great preacher and Bethany is a talented musician. Bethany played the piano for three of the Faith Baptist Bible College Chorale's European tours. After much prayer and preparation, the Lord allowed us to hold a baptism in June 2021. God gave us good weather for the baptism of four people in our landlord's swimming pool. On June 20th, 2021, we officially organized as an independent Baptist church and Luke Snell was installed as the pastor. The following month, our German church held a very touching farewell service for us. On August 12th, we left Germany rejoicing in what God had done through His grace in our lives and ministry over the past 36 years. The day we left Germany, Baptist and Missions missionaries Caleb and Missy Metzger and their three children moved into our house in Ingelheim. The church has continued to grow under their ministry. It is a blessing to know that God is continuing to build His church in Ingelheim, Germany, and that the McCrocklin family is on deputation to raise support for their future ministry in Germany. Many of the Baptist and Missions missionaries in Germany have entered retirement. Pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into His harvest. During our years of ministry in Austria and Germany, there have been some disappointments and trials along the way. As we look over the past 36 years, we praise God for sustaining us and giving us lasting fruit for our labor. Emmanuel Seewald was saved during our time in Austria. He graduated from Faith Baptist Bible College in Ankeny, Iowa, where he met his wife, Julie. Today, Emmanuel and Julie have two children, and are actively serving the Lord in Lynchburg, Virginia. Emmanuel helped us long distance to design a new church logo, a church sign, and a website. Simon was a single student when he first started attending our church in Geisenheim, Germany. Now he is married and serving as a deacon in our sister church in Erlangen, Germany. Through the years, God has used Baptist Mid-Missions missionaries to win souls to Christ and plant churches in Germany. It was a special blessing to be recognized by these faithful pastors for our years of ministry among them. Our family and some friends gave us a warm welcome when we arrived at the airport in Des Moines, Iowa. Tim and Ashley and their two children Sean and Julie and their four children, Sarah and Jacob and their three boys, Stephen and Justina and their four children. We are looking forward to spending time with our children and grandchildren and encouraging them in their walk with the Lord. We left Germany with the goal of retiring from the mission in 2022 after we have reported to our 32 supporting churches located from Colorado to New Jersey. In July 2022, we are scheduled to receive our 40-year service pins from Baptist Admissions. It has been a privilege to represent the Lord and faithful supporters like you in Austria and Germany these many years. We thank God for His provision through faithful supporters like you. I trust you can rejoice with us in what God has done in Austria and in Germany in answer to your faithful prayer and support. And so we are so thankful that we were able, able to come back again one last time and talk with you without the echo. <laughs> and we're so thankful that we can have some fun time with you. In fact, uh, yesterday evening we were out with uh, Ken and Brenda and where are you, Ken? Show me your hand. Are you here somewhere? Did, 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 back, okay, oh, there you are. 
somewhere. Again, there he is. No more. There's Ken and Brenda. <laughs> okay. He took me a nice, he took actually a, a really nice tour of the whole city last night as we were looking for a place to eat and everything was booked full, but we ended up in a very, very nice little restaurant and tasted some delicacies that I've never tasted before. If you want to know more about it, you'll have to ask them afterwards. I would highly recommend this place. And then um, also we had a wonderful time staying overnight with our hosts, uh, with uh, Jeff and, Sh nope, that's wrong. Uh, where are they on here somewhere? Um, Justin, Gordon. Justin and Stacy. Justin and Stacy, Lucas, Devin, and Caleb. There. So some of you are right here in the front row, right? And I'm not sure where your dads are. Your dad, there you way in the back, okay. Now Justin came uh, to Germany. He was there for about a year uh, working with the military and uh, he stopped by to visit us for a little while while he was there. And so we got to know him. And so he was so anxious for us to come and stay with him. So we stayed there last night and again this evening and get to meet his wife, the lovely wife and the, uh, and the children. And so they've been a real blessing as well to us. Something happened last night that's never happened before. As we were getting ready to go to bed, their oldest son, what's your name? I am Lucas. Le Lucas. Lucas. Luca. Yeah. Came to the bedroom door and he said, may I pray with you before you go to bed? Wasn't that sweet? That's never happened before. So we thank you for your love and your care for us as well. And then I was so sad to hear that Pastor Tom wasn't going to be here this morning. Uh, he was not feeling too well last week, but I understand that he's not able to be here today. So Tom, if you're listening or you see this later on, uh, we just want to say thank God for you and for the ministry that you had here in, in laying the groundwork for this beautiful church. And so that Pastor Jeff, that you mentored these many years, is able to come and, and, and take up the reins and continue the great ministry that was started here. And we're just so rejoicing with you to see how God is continuing to work here in the life and church of this life and, and uh, ministry of this church. And understanding that there's going to be a new Christian school starting up soon. And wow, is that great or not? Yeah. Uh, we've been in churches that have had to close their schools because of finances or lack of enrollment. But I can see that there's a, a spiritual need for that school right here. And so we're praying with you. You know, even though we're going to retire and we're not going to be around uh, to visit you again probably unless the Lord intervenes somewhere along the way, we're going to continue to pray for you. And so we know how to pray for you better now that we've been here, especially for Pastor Jacob as well and their new adventure that's coming up. And so we're, we're actually uh, happy to be here for that as well. So then um, I don't know if you knew Pastor Spinks that was the pastor of Berean Baptist or still is at Berean Baptist here in Ohio, uh, Berea, Ohio. His daughter, uh, Bethany, now Bethany Snell was in that presentation. You may have seen Luke and Bethany Snell and their two boys. So uh, Bethany is a, an accomplished musician, plays violin and piano and like you saw, she played for the crowd two, three times as, as they were in, in Europe. Uh, but they were just a blessing to be there with us uh, in the time that they were with us from January of last year until we left in August. And so we're thanking God for them and that God has led them to continue the work that had, was started there in Ingelheim. And so I think that's about it for right now, except that we are so happy that we could also spend some time with Sandy. And, and uh, she's invited us to, to, to lunch today. Uh, I guess you call it lunch or you call it dinner here. <laughs> Whichever it is, okay. I, we were talking last night. And, and, you know, some people, the evening meal they call dinner. dinner. And I feel sorry for them because they'll never get to take part in the marriage supper of the lamb, will they? <laughs> <laughs> So whatever. So that's, that's kind of the introduction tonight. And so uh, my wife was actually uh, born in Munich, Germany. Her parents were missionaries there, as you saw in the presentation. She was saved at the age of six after family devotions. And the next day was Easter Sunday. And uh, her dad saw her coming down the stairs out of, uh, down to breakfast. He said, there comes my brand new girl. And so God has been so faithful to our family. Uh, and uh, she, he's given us four wonderful children all married to believing mates that love the Lord and they're all actively more or less involved in local churches where they are there in Iowa. And so God's been good to us. He's given us a house to live in there in Ankeny, Iowa. That's the same town where the college is that we, uh, that's our alma, alma mater, so to speak. And at the same time there in Ankeny, Iowa, we are within about a 30 minute drive of all of our four children and our 13 grandchildren. 
So if any of you are grandparents, you know how much fun that can be, spending time with your grandchildren. And so we've been separated from them most of their lives, 5,000 miles away. And so it's been fun and been good to, to be back with them. We had two of our fam the kids and our family's kids in our home today before we left. And so it's good to be there to have an opportunity to minister them, to them as well. If you have your Bibles, please open them to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We shipped some of our belongings from Germany uh, back to Ankeny, and they were supposed to arrive before we got there, or shortly thereafter in August. And uh, among the things we shipped back were all of my Bibles in various languages. And unfortunately, the things that we shipped didn't arrive in Ankeny until November. And so we dug out some things that we'd had in storage that had been in storage for about 10 years since we actually had been back to the States on a longer period of time. And in the things that we had stored, I found my old King James Bible, complete with all the notes that I wrote in it when I was going to Faith Baptist Bible College. And so it's brought back some memories. And so I hope you're not too offended this morning. I'm from the old school still. You probably see that in the way I talk and the way I dress. Anyway, uh, I'm going to preach out of that Bible, if you don't mind today. Uh, this is the Bible that I used, the memorized Bible verses out of. And actually, my life's verse is in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17. So let's pick up the text there, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, beginning with verse 17 and continuing to the end of the chapter. Follow along, please. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 17 to 21. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation, to wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Let's pray. Precious Heavenly Father, we thank you for your eternal word that's established forever in heaven. And we thank you, dear God, that uh, your word is living, it's quick, and it's powerful. It's able to discern even the intents and thoughts of our hearts. We pray this morning, God, that as your word is proclaimed, that your Holy Spirit would take these words and indelibly impress them upon our hearts. Pray, God, that even this morning that we would not just be hearers of the word, that we might be doers of the word, that you would glorify yourself in and through us today and in the days ahead. And we'll give you the praise in Christ's name. Amen. So let's see here if this will work. Ready? Oh, turned on. Magic. Look at that. <laughs> okay. So the title of the message today is Reconciliation. Restoring our relationship with God from 2 Corinthians 5, uh, 17 to 21. And as we look at this passage today, we find actually that it's very um, similar to the Great Commission passages that we find in the Bible. We find uh, the Great Commission in each of the four Gospels and again in the book of Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. You might remember these. Some of you may have memorized these passages Matthew 28, 19 and 20, but you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Spirit has come. No, that's wrong. That's Acts. Um, Go ye therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and know I am with you all the way, even to the end of the world. And then in Mark chapter 16, verse 15, and he said unto them, Go ye therefore and preach the gospel to every creature. And then Luke 24, 46, 48, John 20, 21, and then Acts 1, 8, probably a very familiar passage. But you, shall, but you shall receive power after that the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in Judea 
and in Samaria and all into the uttermost parts of the earth. So this passage before us today, though, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 17 to 21, I, I believe could also be considered among these Great Commission passages. The theme of this passage is reconciliation. If you notice there in these three short verses, verses 18 to 20, the, the term or the word reconciliation in some form appears five times. And so I believe that the major theme that Paul is speaking about here in these, in these verses has to do with reconciliation. And so let us consider three aspects of reconciliation. First of all, the meaning of reconciliation, and then the ministry of reconciliation, and finally, the message of reconciliation. First of all, the meaning of reconciliation. Reconciliation means to be restored to a previous condition. And before I was uh, actually um, saved, I attended an auto mechanic school and I became a hobby me uh, auto mechanic and I enjoyed restoring old cars. And one of the cars that I restored was a 1963 and a half Ford Falcon. Uh, it came stack factory with a 260 V8, 260 inch uh, cubic inch V8 and a four speed transmission and a tachometer on the dash. I found that uh, when I was stationed in Cheyenne, Wyoming, uh, serving the Lord in the, in the Air Force, and after uh, buying the car, I was in the process of restoring it. I had fun going to the junkyards there in Cheyenne, finding the parts mechanically, rebuilt the transmission and all that, and then I had the interior redone, and finally I had it painted to that deep purple color that was the original color for the car. It was a jewel when I got done. And so that was, that's what restoration means, restoring something to a, a previous condition or as nearly as possible in the case of that car. Uh, spiritually speaking, reconciliation means to have a broken relationship restored. And that's what Sp Paul is speaking about here under inspiration of the Holy Spirit as he writes the church there in Corinth. And he says, there's a need for reconciliation. Uh, we are sinners. We are lost sinners. God is holy. And we need to be, as lost sinners, reconciled to this holy God. We need to have a spiritual relationship restored to its previous condition. The need for reconciliation is as old as the human race. You remember that when God created Adam and Eve and placed them in this beautiful garden in Eden, that they had perfect communion, perfect fellowship with the Lord and he even enjoyed coming in the cool of the day and, and talking and walking with, the, with the Adam and Eve until that day when they rebelled against God. God said to them earlier that, you know, you can enjoy and eat of the fruit of all the trees of this garden except for that one tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And they rebelled. They ate of that tree. And in that moment they fell into sin and that beautiful relationship with God was broken. The fellowship, the relationship was broken. And the only way that that could be restored to be reconciled to God was that God had to slay an animal. The first blood that was shed, God shed on this earth. And we know in the New Testament without the shedding of blood there is no remission of sin. And so God slew that animal, shed its blood, as an atonement for their sin. Atonement means a, a temporary covering of the skin, of that sin so they could be restored to their fellowship. Well, then Adam and Eve were provided the skins of that, that animal and they clothed themselves to cover their nakedness in acceptance of God's provision for their sin uh, 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 forgiveness. And so they showed through that their faith in what God had provided for them. The need for reconciliation then is as old as human race and Adam and Eve uh, uh, ex experienced uh, the forgiveness that they needed uh, through accepting God's sacrifice for their sin. The animal that was shed, the blood that was shed of that animal. We'll come back to that a little bit later. Now secondly, not only the meaning of reconciliation, remember reconciliation means to restore something to its previous condition and in the case of man, we needed to be restored as sinners to the relationship with the Holy God. And God provided that means in the Old Testament through the shedding of blood of an animal. And now let's look at the ministry of reconciliation. As you might read that text there in verse 18, And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself, and hath given to us 
the ministry of reconciliation. The ministry of reconciliation. Uh, you notice there in verse 20 this word ambassador. And I believe that really uh, puts the idea of the ministry of reconciliation together into one concept of being an ambassador. An ambassador for Christ in this case. And so what is an ambassador? An ambassador is someone representing a higher authority to a foreign entity. An ambassador is someone representing a higher authority to a foreign entity. We are familiar with the, with the concept of ambassadorship from America because America has its ambassadors and they represent a higher authority, their nation, their government, to foreign entity, entities, to other, other nations. Okay, and so it's, it's a privilege then to be an ambassador of the United States, the greatest nation on the face of this earth, uh, in spite of all of our problems and difficulties. Nevertheless, an ambassador has been uh, appointed, has been commanded by our nation to be our representative to foreign entities. Now, and to become an ambassador for the United States, you have to be... Uh, uh, go through a, a long process of being vetted. They check your background and they also see if you have the ability to be able to, to um, adequately represent your nation to foreign uh, cultures and foreign things. There are certain protocols you have to learn when you go from one country to the next. And uh, so to become an ambassador is a, is a, a tedious and a, a very trying process. And then you become the ambassador of the United States. But you know what? As an ambassador of the Lord Jesus Christ, you don't have to do any of that. <laughs> because what does it say here? Now then we are ambassadors for Christ. Paul is speaking to the church, to believers, those who are in Christ, including himself, and saying, we are ambassadors for Christ. No long process is involved. The moment you trust Christ as your Savior, you become his ambassador. And what a privilege it is to be an ambassador of the United States, but even a grander Privilege to be the ambassador of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Are you rejoicing that you're an ambassador of him today? Man. And so he says then we are ambassadors for Christ. We are ambassadors for Christ. Well, there's some interesting things about being an ambassador for Christ. Every believer has been given a mandate, an official order or authorization for God to be his ambassador, as we just seen. And everyone without exception is an ambassador for Christ. You don't have to sign a piece of paper. You don't have to go through any vetting process. Immediately, the moment you're saved, you're his ambassador. And the message of salvation through faith in Christ is the message that we've been given to tell the uh, nations of the world, the Great Commission. There's one more thing that I would like to consider here, in be, in being an ambassador. You know, sometimes ambassadors are sent to hostile nations. Sometimes they're sent to friendly nations, and that's always fun, you know, for our ambassador to be representing the United States to friendly nations. But sometimes we're sent, they are sent to a hostile nation. And nevertheless, whether they, whether they feel like they should do this or not, they've been commanded to do that by their nation, and they have a message to give to that nation. And so that's their job as our ambassadors uh, to these foreign nations. As an ambassador of the Lord Jesus Christ, sometimes God sends us to people that are open to the gospel, and many people come to Christ as Savior, and uh, churches are established, and missionaries can write glowing letters about all the, the things that God has done. But you know, when the United States sends an ambassador to Saudi Arabia, he has to learn how to not offend those people, right? And uh, you have to understand that some of their customs are different. Their government is different. And even their economic system is different. And so we don't send ambassadors to Saudi Arabia to change their economic system or their government. We send them there to deliver a singular message that they've been given by their government. And we, as your ambassadors, as ambassadors of Jesus Christ, have been sent to Austria and Germany. Where we were in Austria, we lived in an area that was over 90% Roman Catholic. And sometimes they weren't very friendly to us. <laughs> they were a little hostile to us. Nevertheless, the Lord sent us there, and we had opportunity to share the gospel. Some of them came to Christ as Savior. Some of them were baptized, and a church was established there. And then the Lord brought us to Germany, and they were a little more open to the gospel. And they weren't quite as reserved into their traditions of their, of their church. And as you saw in the presentation, 
Um, about a third of the country in Germany is, is Roman Catholic, about a third is Lutheran, and about a third of them are, are nothing, so to speak. They have no religion. And so we, we came to, to, to Germany, and, and we found out that there were some things about the culture, so to speak, the, the protocol that we needed to observe if we were going to, to be uh, his ambassadors to the country. And one of the things we learned was the, you know, See, I, was, I, was brought, I grew up on a farm, and, and I was accustomed to working hard and long hours, and I don't ever remember stopping in the middle of the afternoon to drink coffee and eat cake. And that was just not a thing we did on the farm. But uh, in Germany, that's kind of a custom, customary thing you do. They, they call it Café und Kuchen, about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, especially on a Sunday afternoon, like on a day like this, go out for, eat, 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 eat the new meal, let's put it that way and eat the noon meal, and then maybe take a, an hour leisurely walk. And Sandy, you probably remember this as well as being in, v in Vienna. That's kind of what they did there. And then in the afternoon, you come together, and uh, you have coffee and Kuchen, right? Well, I didn't know that. In fact, I wasn't even a coffee drinker growing up on the farm. But when we got to Austria, for example, actually we were in Germany my first couple of months, and, and my wife was she, born, she was born and reared there. She knew the language, and so she was inviting folk into our home, you know, hospitality. And we're sitting at the table, and, and we have coffee and cake. But it's not just a cup of coffee or a piece of cake. What is it? It's a lot of cups of coffee and a lot of pieces of cake. And it, and it goes over a two- or three-hour period, you know. It, this is like in a social event, par excellence, yeah? And it, it's not just one cake. It's two or three cakes, and if the people you invite... They want to bring their cake, and so you can't offend anybody, you know. You've got to have a piece of each one of those cakes. You have to suffer for Jesus if you're going to be a missionary, you know, in Germany and Austria. So that's, that's what, one of the things I had to learn in order to reach the people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Of course, the other thing is the language barrier. And again, my wife, uh, she, she's always had fun with my language mistakes as I, as I go along the way, sometimes teaching or preaching or um, even in family devotions, uh, some of you that speak German know that there, is, there are root words in German, and they can change their meaning dramatically depending on the prefix. For example, the word speisen means to eat or to feed, depending on the prefix. And so I was telling this story to my kids one night for family devotions about how Jesus ate the 5,000. And uh, <laughs> no, Dad, he fed the 5,000. Okay. And, and so there are always interesting aspects of, of, of fulfilling that ministry, being a reconciliation, uh, a minister of Christ, an ambassador for Christ, and being his ambassador. So we see here then the ministry of reconciliation um, is uh, actually put together with the word ambassador, and we are ambassadors for Christ. Sometimes we're sent to a hostile nation, but you know even here in America, uh, there's hostility towards born-again Christians. Even here, you know, uh, the world does not agree with us in a lot of biblical issues. For example, uh, abortion <laughs> or gender identity or, or homosexual marriage. These things that are adamantly opposed to the holiness of God and his word. And we as born-again believers, we accept this as being the, the norm for a Christian to live by. But unsafe people, they don't understand that. Their, their eyes have been blinded and their hearts have been hardened and they're so against that. Nevertheless, as his ambassadors, even though being sent sometimes to a hostile nation, we need to be careful that we keep the message in the center point of our ministry. And now we're coming to the message. Okay, after they're saved, after you're saved. This is my, this is my, uh, ready to sing now. I think I can sing. Um, I wanted to make this transition here from the message, uh, from the ministry to the message. And the message that we've been given, of course, is that lost sinners can be reconciled to a holy God. And my life's verse is um, verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And this is a little chorus that I learned. Uh, when I was stationed in Cheyenne, the cowboy uh, evangelist came through there at Faith Baptist Church in Cheyenne, Wyoming, and, and taught us this little course. I don't know if any of you have heard this before, but uh, I'm going to try to sing it for you now. Mm -hmm. 
Things are different now. Something happened to me when I gave my heart to Jesus. Things are different now. I was changed, it must be, when I gave my heart to Him. Things I loved before have passed away. Things I love far more have come to stay. Things are different now. Something happened that day when I gave my heart to Him. That's so, I believe, puts together the, the message of 2 Corinthians 5.17. Uh, thank you, Ruby, for playing that little chorus. Uh, if any man be in Christ, what, things are different now. Yeah, I was changed. It must be. And when I was saved at the age of 21 at the, the Mount of Regular Baptist Church in southern Iowa, I didn't really understand all the things that were going to take place in my life. But I look back on that and I can say, that's the day when the great adventure began. Because <laughs> I had no clue where that would lead me in my life. See, I grew up on a farm and I could speak to the animals. And my wife grew up in Munich and she's always amazed at how I can speak to the animals, call the pigs and call the chickens and call the cows and you know, all that. But I had no idea that someday God would be uh, asking me to learn this verrückte deutsche Sprache, yeah, und das Menschen zum Glauben an Jesus Christus kommen sollten. Yeah, then God would ask me to, to learn this crazy German language so I can tell people how to be saved. And so as that happened, though, I saw in my life things changed. I, I, I had a, a new attitudes, I had new activities, a, a new awareness that God was doing something in my life. And so when I came across this verse, then I said, that's it. That's what's happened in my life. Therefore, if any man, any man be in Christ, he's a, a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Uh, my language changed. My activities changed. Uh, my awareness of God at work in my life. Uh, that's actually the life's verse that I chose that explains what God has done in my life. And, you know, being an ambassador for Christ, remember I said that uh, is, is very similar to the Great Commission passages. But being an ambassador for Christ is not just preaching the gospel, uh, making disciples, or being a witness. It involves a changed life from the inside out. And that's what an ambassador does. He not only has a message to declare, but he has a life to live so that people can see Christ in us. And that verse says, if any man be what? In Christ. It's the eternal relationship we have with, with God through faith in His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what it means to be in Christ. We know Him as our personal Savior, and He's come into our lives, and He's changed us and, and made us into new creations uh, in His uh, working in our lives. Well, the ambassador for Christ, He's been given um, this ministry of reconciliation, and now we also see here that we've been given this message of reconciliation. And what is that message? Uh, it's a mandate to tell lost sinners that they can be reconciled to a holy God. And what a privilege it is to be able to share the gospel with people and to be able to give your testimony to them to see how God has worked in your life, how he saved you, how he changed you. And you can share that simple a testimony, a gospel message, being a witness for Christ without having a lot of theological or biblical knowledge. If you had trusted Christ as your Savior, may I encourage you, don't wait. <laughs> right after I got saved, uh, I didn't know a lot about the Bible. In fact, I had some really weird ideas there. Uh, I remember my pastor in Cheyenne, Wyoming, trying to be patient with me in that respect. But I, nevertheless, I was telling my cousins how they could be saved immediately thereafter. It's important that we share the gospel with people regardless of our uh, knowledge of the scriptures. If we've had that Christ is our Savior, He's the one that's changed our lives, and they can see that as well. Well, we're lost sinners. We're all of sin and come short of the glory of God and being justified freely by the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. And so the Bible makes it clear that we're all lost. And so we need to know Christ as our Savior. And that's, that's what I uh, experienced at the age of, of 21. 
And then, because God is holy and just, every sin that was ever committed by every person who ever lived must be punished. That's a new revelation to even some Christians. They don't consider that. Because God is holy and just, every sin that was ever committed by every person who ever lived must be punished. God is loving and merciful, but he's also holy and just. And there's only two ways that our sins can be judged. The first one is if we refuse to accept Christ as our Savior, then we will personally be judged by God in a terrible place called hell for the rest of eternity. That's how our sins will be judged, if we refuse the gift of salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. If you're here today and you know something about Christ, as I did growing up on the farm, but don't know him personally as your Savior, may I encourage you before you leave here today to make that very certain in your life. It's, a, it's more important to know uh, Jesus as your personal Savior than any other decision you'll ever make in your life. And it's not enough to just know about Christ or know about salvation or have memorized Bible verses. You need to know Him personally as your Savior because that is the, the step that will change your life, make you a new creature in Christ Jesus, and open up a whole world of spiritual understanding that you didn't have before. Because God is holy and just. Well, the second way that your sin can be judged is if you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. <laughs> because He took the penalty of our sin on Himself when He died on the cross. Vicariously, in our place, Jesus shed His blood as a full payment for our sin debt. And we call this a substitutionary sacrifice. He took our place on the cross and paid the debt that we owe. He owed a debt he did not pay. He, uh, he owed a debt that he did not pay and I had a debt that I could not pay. So if Romans 5 1 says, therefore being justified by faith we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And Romans 8 1, therefore there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. These are, uh, these are examples of the justification that we have through faith in Jesus Christ. And when we trusted Christ as our Savior, our sin debt was paid in full, and we were justified or made righteous in His eyes. And these are the two verses that I quoted, Romans 5.1 and Romans 8.1. Sinners can be reconciled to a holy God. That's our message. That's the message that we've been given. And the great exchange we find there in verse 19, the word imputation means to apply to someone's account. And so if you have $50 and you go to the bank and you deposit it in your account, it's, it's put to your account. And you can see your bank statement and you see the money is there. And we know that here in verse 19, that as we read that, that uh, uh, the, he did not impute our trespasses to us, but he committed and hath committed to us the word of reconciliation. Our sin debt was imputed, put onto his account as he died on the cross. He bore the sin debt that we owe. And at the same time, when we trusted Christ as our Savior, his righteousness was imputed to us, was put to our account. The Bible says that we're, at the moment of salvation, we're clothed in the righteousness of God so that we no, he no longer sees our sin debt, but he sees the righteousness of Christ. It's the idea of... of uh, substitutionary atonement that we see also in, in uh, uh, Isaiah chapter 53 verse, verses 5 and 6. He was wounded for our transgressions, transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities and the chastisement of our peace was laid on him or placed on him. And so we read also there that the, uh, he is the, uh, the sheep led to the slaughter before his shearers and dumb before his ears, and he opened not his mouth, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. So here we have the concept of substitutionary sacrifice way back in the Old Testament. And so that same thing we talked about earlier, that when God shed the blood of the animal in the Garden of Eden, and Adam and Eve applied that to their sin debt, and they were forgiven, 
and they clothed themselves in the animal skins to hide their nakedness before God. The moment we accept Christ as our Savior, then we are clothed in His righteousness. And His blood that was shed on our behalf was more than just a temporary covering or an atonement. It was, it was a complete satisfaction of all the just demands of God. In Hebrews chapter 10, we read that the once for all sacrifice for Jesus Christ cleansed forever those who trust in Him as their Savior. And, and so this great uh, 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 event took place this great message that we have to, to, send, to tell the nation. Reconciliation is only possible through the substitutionary sacrifice of Christ on the cross. Um, we have seen the meaning of reconciliation. We've seen the ministry of reconciliation. And finally, the message of reconciliation. Again, the message, verse 21, For he, God, hath made him, Christ, to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. Reconciliation means to restore a broken relationship to its previous condition. Every believer has been given a ministry of, of representing Christ to the world as His ambassadors. And as ambassadors for Christ, we are called to deliver the message of reconciliation that lost sinners can be reconciled to God. I'd like to close with a... Uh, um, an example, a bold example of reconciliation that we hear about in the country of Ireland. In Dublin in the 1500s, there were two clans that were warring against each other, the Ormonds and the Kildares. And they were feuding uh, for years and years. There was violent killing and there was a continual uh, bickering and fighting among them. And at one point, the leaders of the Ormond clans took refuge in St. Patrick's Cathedral in Ireland. And they locked that big heavy wooden door in to, to find protection against the Kildares that were surrounding the building and with swords drawn, besieging the building for days and days. And at one point, the uh, uh, Earl. Earl, thank you, the Earl of Kildares came to himself and said, this is foolish. Why, why are we constantly at, uh, at each other's throat? Why are we feuding like this? He said, we both believe in the same God and we're all Irishmen. And so he said, this is foolish. And so he, he went to the door of the chapter house there in St. Patrick's Cathedral and, and he spoke very loudly and he says, let's call this feud off. Let's shake hands and be reconciled. And there was no response, no answer from the other side of the door. And so what the Earl of the Kildare then did, goes down in the annals of history of Ireland, pulled out his sword and began gouging a hole in that big oak wooden door. And it took a long time, of course, but finally he got the hole big enough that he could reach his hand and part of his arm through that hole. And he said, let's shake hands and call this feud off. Well, on the other side, desperate soldiers of course, with the hormones, their swords in hand, you know, that was a very uh, courageous thing to do. It wasn't to stick your hand through that hole in the door. But what happened? Well, the Earl of the Ormonds then reached out his hand, shook the hand of the Earl of Kildare, and peace was made between the two warring tribes. The door flung open, and reconciliation took place. And they embraced one another. And it became then a, a, an example of reconciliation that even today I believe that we can take a lesson from. Well, if you're here today and maybe you, like I, as a, as a young man, knew a lot about Christ but didn't know Him as my personal Savior, I believe that God is reaching His hand out to you today just like it in, the, in that story of the hormones and the Kildares. God's reaching out His hand to you saying, you know, it's, it's good that you know a lot about Christ, but if you don't know Him as your personal Savior, today would be the best day in the world for you to, to reach out your hand and accept Christ as your Savior. You know, God saves young people. At six years old, my wife was saved. You know, and He saves old people like me. I'm really old, okay? Anyway, and He saves everybody who will just reach out their hand, take the hand of Jesus and say, yes, I 
Thank you for dying for my sins on the cross and, and I pray that you'll forgive me my sin debt and give me the gift of eternal life. If you do that this morning, he'll save you. And you'll become a child of God. And, and you'll have a home in heaven waiting for you. Oh, maybe there's even some issues, you know. Reconciliation is not only necessary between God and us, and he's the one that does the reconciling, by the way. We, we have nothing to offer him. But it may be that between individuals, even here this morning, there's a need for reconciliation. Uh, I don't suppose you've ever had that. I know my wife and I, we've had, we've had arguments. We've had disputes, you know. And there have been times when we've had to be reconciled to one another. <laughs> and there's been times when we recognize, you know, that, that was foolish, that's stupid, you know. I shouldn't have said that, but I'm sorry. Will you forgive me? And I seem like I do that on a daily basis anymore. I'm not sure what the problem is. But anyway, uh, the... <laughs> Sometimes you need to be reconciled to your mate. Sometimes you need to be reconciled maybe to, to, your, to your children or they to you. Or maybe it's a coworker. You know, it can even be somebody at school or it might even be somebody here in the church this morning. You know, you, you've said something, you did something, you misunderstood what somebody said, you know, and there was a need, there's a need for reconciliation. You need to reach out your hand to that person that you offended or who offended you and say, let's be reconciled. And if you'll do that this morning, then that relationship can be that was broken because of what was said or done. You know, that can be restored between you and that person as well. So God is our example of how important reconciliation is. And if we follow his example this morning, if you have an issue with a brother or sister in Christ, you need to be reconciled to them as well. And so I would pray this morning that if your need is for reconciliation with God, that you will take advantage of this opportunity and that you'll ask Christ to be your Savior. And perhaps if there's a need for reconciliation uh, between yourself and another individual here this morning, or individuals, that you also will take advantage of this opportunity after the service. Um, as Pastor said, we'll be over at the display table after. If you want to talk to us, we'll be there. But don't forget to help in the garage to unload that, that trailer as well. Yeah, okay, let's pray. Precious Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it's eternal. And we thank you, God, for the Holy Spirit that takes your word and, and through these stammering lips that you can speak to people's hearts. And Lord, if there's a need for reconciliation here today, that I pray that these hearers today would be doers of the word, uh, that they would be reconciled to you. If they don't know Christ as Savior, that today would be the day of their salvation. Oh, how we would rejoice with you in that. And if there is a need for reconciliation among individuals here today, that again, that would take place after the service and uh, that you would glorify yourself through us. Thank you that you've given this, this great commission and as your ambassadors, ambassadors for Christ, I pray that, that today and even in the days ahead that we will take uh, this message and, and, uh, and indelibly impress the importance of being your ambassadors uh, now before it's eternally too late. Lord, there's so many things that we'll uh, be able to do in heaven that we can't do here on earth. And, and Lord, there's some things that we do here on earth that we can't do in heaven. And one of those things we, we can do now that we can't do in heaven is tell someone about Jesus and how they can be saved. Because in heaven, we're all saved. And so God, I pray that today we would think on that. You know, this is the opportunity you've given us to tell lost sinners how they can be reconciled to you and even individuals to one another. In Christ's name we pray, amen.